our colleagues. And I, I think it's only appropriate that for our first sun up with Sunrise this morning, we actually have the sun up in Minnesota. So um, very happy about that. I need this sunshine and I'm sure the rest of you do as well. I wanna welcome everybody. I'm Terry Banaszewski and I'm Vice President of Business Development for Sunrise Banks. I've been around the community for 20 plus years and with Sunrise for 21 and a half years. So glad you are all tuning in. I know many of you that have attend, uh, signed up and are in the audience and look forward to seeing you in person very soon. Maybe by summertime or fall, we'll be able to get these back in person, which would be wonderful. Uh, I want to give a few business uh, updates with the bank uh, prior to Rick introducing our guest speaker. Uh, as you know, our lobbies have been open since the middle of 21, and we have regular hours in all of our branches right now. Um, our retail staff and our teller line have been working feverishly through this whole pandemic. So I have to give them a big shout out because they've shown up for work every day that they can. And we are pretty much hybrid on our, the rest of our staffing right now. But uh, if you need a banker or someone in our back room, certainly call, we will get you to the right person and our response times have improved greatly. So we're happy to take care of any of your needs. And also, I don't think I have my number posted here, but if you run into any issues, feel free to reach out to me uh, and I can give you that number at the end of the broadcast. We've just launched our 2021 impact report. We will have a link posted on your screen. Uh, that gives you some background on a number of things that we accomplished during 21. And a few items I wanna mention out of that include our SBA department and our PPP program. During 2021, we uh, originated 1,945 loans for about $135 million. 76% of those loans were less than $50,000. So we were in the marketplace where it makes a difference. And we support our nonprofits and our small business owners so much. So we were happy to participate in that. And just a reminder, if you still have a PPP outstanding, please reach out to your banker <clears throat> and get that forgiveness process started because that will be coming to an end very shortly. Other updates uh, during 21, we also had two branches that we decided uh, no longer had the activity levels um, that were needed to sustain them. So we were happy to uh, sell them to local nonprofit buyers to continue to serve our communities and have those, those nonprofits uh, occupy our Vandalia location and our arcade location over on the east side. We also want to remind people, nonprofits, business owners, consumers, that on the campus, cash management front of things. We have numerous products to assist our clients. There's been an increased amount of fraud activity happening all the time, and the industry as a whole is seeing increased fraud from email hacking to check fraud to identity theft, debit cards, mobile deposits, ETMs, you name it. Uh, things are going on out there. So just a reminder, it's always good to engage your banking partner relationships to receive recommendations for services that could help in that regard and best practices to protect your assets. Lastly, on my little agenda here, I want to mention our new markets tax credit program. Um, it's been a very powerful tool that many area nonprofits have been able to leverage over the years to expand their services to our community, particularly in places where the need is the greatest. We're always willing to meet with organizations and businesses to share more about this program and how it works as a powerful tool for economic development and is very favorable to the borrower. Some recent and fun examples of projects we've helped fund uh, include Juxtaposition Arts, which broke ground this fall on their expanded campus that will expand their work as the only black-led 
teen staffed art and design center, gallery, retail shop, and artist studio space in North Minneapolis. The new NDC Entrepreneurship Training Center opened in the fall of 2021 as the new NDC headquarters and an entrepreneurship training center and business incubator, aimed primarily at serving the minority-owned small businesses in our community. Without new markets tax credit allocation from Sunrise Banks and other CDEs supporting these amazing organizations in our community, these projects would not have happened. So with that, I'd like to uh, end my welcome and turn the floor over to Rick Beeson, our EVP of Government Relations and B Corporate Development. And many of you know him, so go ahead, Rick, take it away. Well, thanks, Terry, and uh, good morning, friends of Sunrise Banks, and welcome to another Sun Up with, uh, with Sunrise. And this morning, of course, we're very excited to have Nanoko Sato, Executive Director of the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, with us. The nonprofit sector is very important and a very significant part of the Sunrise Bank business model, and we have a history over many decades of working with this wonderful group of mission-based businesses with their financial needs. And having been here for almost 35 years, uh, it's been absolutely amazing to watch the growth of this uh, this industry owing really to both the government's um, retreat in providing direct social service to folks and uh, our communities, but also the changing and increasing needs of the community and the people. Uh, Nanoco has, leads the largest and most broadly based uh, industry group uh, representing thousands of, uh, of organizations. And although she's relatively new in this position, she's been with the council for three and a half years prior as associate uh, director. And uh, she also uh, ran her own nonprofit at the Bay Area for 10 years and, and importantly continues to volunteer. So she walks the walk, talks the talk, walks the walk uh, with her own uh, volunteer activity. She's a graduate of uh, Carleton College here in Northfield, and uh, and uh, uh, we're really, really pleased to have her here. It's good to see you again, Nanoko, and I'll pass the virtual mic over to you. To you. Uh, but before I do that, I'll just mention, uh, as when she concludes her opening remarks, we're gonna open this up for questions. So feel free to uh, ask the question in the chat room, and I'll uh, field those and uh, send those over to Nanoko. Thanks everybody again for attending. Anoka? Thank you so much, Rick. Good morning, everyone. Uh, nice to not see you all on this virtual screen again, um, but I'm gonna just move this over to the next screen. So um, as Rick said, my name is Nonoko Sato. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I just wanted to do a little quick presentation around the state of the nonprofit sector. Uh, and before I do that, in case you don't know who we are, uh, Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, as Rick said, is one of the is the largest state association of nonprofits in the country. We serve over 2,300 uh, member nonprofit organizations throughout the state, and our mission is to inform, promote, connect, and strengthen the individual nonprofits in the nonprofit sector. Um, so I just wanted to do a quick, quick plug, if that is okay. Um, a couple things that's coming up. One that we are really excited about and keeping our fingers crossed is that we are hoping to bring back our um, annual conference in person at the River Center in St. Paul, October 13th and 14th. And we're currently looking for presenters. Um, we are um, paying for intellectual property now. So uh, we, you know we encourage you to apply. And if you are selected as a workshop presenter, there is a stipend that's attached to that. In addition, um, we have the Mission Nonprofit Awards uh, nominations due. Um, and those are four uh, areas in innovation, anti-racism initiative, advocacy, and uh, responsive philanthropy. And that will come with, with uh, a video to highlight your mission work. And we're always looking for really amazing uh, organizations to highlight throughout the state. Um, a lot of folks know about our 2022 salary survey. We do this every two years. So this is the, um, the year that we're gonna be doing again. And we're also gonna be tying that to the Who Leads in Minnesota um, uh, um, 
information that we are partnering with the Wilder Foundation. And so that really kind of looks at both government uh, corporation as well as the nonprofit sector and looking at the demographics of who is leading in Minnesota. That's been really um, uh, helpful as well. So uh, both of those uh, surveys will, should be coming out soon. And then lastly, I will talk about it sort of towards the end of my present quick presentation, but we encourage you to sign your support for the nonprofit relief fund. Nonprofits have been generally left behind in terms of one-time relief funds during COVID-19. And we are really pushing for a very specific fund that helps to support the nonprofit sector. Um, if you, uh, I, I have some links. If you're interested, feel free to contact me directly or feel free, please go to our website and I will be able to share that with you. Last but not least, I wanted to um, bring your attention to Benefits Minnesota, which is an uh, association health plan that we launched in 2020. Uh, it is a, a, a member-only benefit that supports nonprofits. Uh, it offers coverage for two or more eligible employees, so small organizations are eligible. And we offer five high-quality plan networks um, throughout the state. We partner with Gallagher and Medical on that. Uh, for more information, please visit benefitsminnesota.org. And this is actually tied to our workforce challenges that I'm about to talk, uh, talk to you about. Um, mainly that we have some key challenges and I hope perhaps that that's, this is not necessarily new news to you. Um, just like any other sector, nonprofits are struggling in terms of recruiting, retaining staff and volunteers. Um, and I think volunteers in particular are left behind. Yes, like there are staffing challenges, of course, but volunteers also provide such, such key resources to our nonprofits. And it is also really difficult for all our members to be able to recruit volunteers at this time. Of course, we're also seeing changes in the workforce uh, with um, less uh, workers and more demand in terms of jobs. There are um, expectations that workers tend to have within the organization. So that is leading to some shifts in cultural um, operations and internal operations. Um, and in addition to that, after the um, murder of George Floyd and the subsequent racial uprising that happened in Minneapolis, there's a lot of organizations that really deeply care about the work of equity and DEI and how they're trying to infuse that into their day-to-day -day work. Uh, you also might be struggling with this as well. Do we go back to in-person? Do we stay remote? Do we offer a hybrid uh, option? Some organizations, of course, have the option to choose, and some organizations don't. If you are working directly with the community served, you have to be in-person. And But this is also tied to the way that we can support our work workers um, who are looking more for flexible uh, opportunities in terms of um, uh, work that they have to do and where they can where, where they can do that work. Uh, in terms of also the workforce sh um, shortages, this is also leading into many leadership transitions as well. We're seeing a lot of executive directors retiring and organizations are um, ramping up their efforts to recruit really a talented talent um, into these organizations. Uh, as well as mental health support, I think there is more of a conversation around that, both in terms of physical and uh, mental safety within the work. And it is exhausting, uh, especially the direct service organizations should know, uh, so that um, there is more of a demand for mental health support as well. Nonprofits are also reporting more um, increase in demand. Com communities are really in need, and yet they're seeing a diminished capacity in their ability to be able to serve them, and also meeting, trying to meet community support and expectations. I'll try to speed this up a little bit. Here we go. Um, this graph right here, um, we have done a nonprofit economy survey uh, each year, but in 2020, we pivoted to do a COVID-19 specific impact report. Uh, we have done five of those. So these are statistics and data that we are getting back um, in our last fifth edition, which was released in December of last year. So nonprofit economy continues to remain strong. We are still 14% of the economy. But as you can see, there was a dip between 2020 and 2021 in terms of the number of workers that returned. So while so the reason why we're still 14% of the overall workforce is that all the different sectors have seen a dip in terms of the number of workers returning. Um, so we're still at 14%, but we have lost about 30,000 workers since 2020 and 2021. Um, this is just our statistics from our job board. And so uh, 2020, you see the blue lines. And then, of course, you see a huge dip in uh, April, May, March and April of 2020 when the pandemic hit. Uh, 
and then in uh and then you can see in orange sorry it's just like i'm like trying to like look at this little small um in orange you see that uh the jobs have come back in full force uh starting in march of 2020 as well the thing is that the number of in 2021 was about six thousand compared to ten thousand um it, prior to that, the average number of postings that people are looking at decreased by 32%. So there are less people looking for jobs than there are jobs actually available out there. Um, then in addition to that, nonprofits have, as I mentioned earlier, have received limited relief. Um, so only 3.7% of all PPP loans went to nonprofits. Um, less than 50% of the eligible non Minnesota nonprofits obtain a PPP loan. There's so many reasons behind this, of course. Uh, one being that, you know, you needed to have a banking partner. And so if you weren't partners with an amazing banking partner like Sunrise, uh, sometimes it was really hard to obtain them. Nonprofits also struggle in, you know, putting in a loan on, in their books uh, and whether or not, it, it, are, we, are we actually going to get this forgiven? We had a lot of questions around that. Um, we also, in, the, the initial PPP loans excluded organizations that had more than 500 employees. And that was a really big challenge because they're still smallish compared to very large institutions and yet and they of course needed a lot of help um in the main street loan programs as well as the employee retention tax credit um again many fewer nonprofits also received those the support that was available as well um this slide kind of shows i'm sorry i'm going to be looking at a different screen so i can just be a little bit bigger uh, kind of shows the responses that we received around changes to programming that organizations have made over the past six months. Keep in mind, this was again released in December, but still, I think this applies. Many organizations augmented their programming to really meet the core needs of their communities, uh, workforce challenges in hiring, reductions in programming, staff turnovers. These were the really big common themes that we heard um, from a lot of different nonprofits throughout the state. Um, and then in addition to that, <clears throat> here are some like shifts and conversations that we're hearing in the sector. And I'm also curious to hear from you all at some point if uh, you're also hearing the same. So of course, nonprofits have always struggled in providing competitive wages and benefits to attract and uh, retain strong talent. Our work is complicated, it's intersectional, and we really need strong and talented and experienced leaders in our field. And it is really difficult to do so when we are constantly um, underpaying and are, are, are unable to offer benefits to uh, bring that talent into our sector. Uh, and this has become more of an issue, of course, with the workforce challenges, as well as uh, a huge uh, burnout that we are hearing from direct service providers. Um, and so that is something that you know organizations are constantly trying to address questions around what does an adaptive and flexible work environment look like, especially after COVID. We all know that now we can work semi-remotely from home, but we're missing the opportunity to be with, in community with each other. We have missed the opportunity to have face-to-face -face conversations. Uh, many communities were unable to be served because they needed to be in person. So these are things that we are all grappling with. And then also as employers, we're asking questions around what does it mean to be a human-centered organization? How do we support our staff, especially around mental health? And then questions around like, what does it mean to be an anti-racist organization? How do we infuse DEI into our work? It's always a challenge, of course, and uh, that is a, it's a constant conversation that we need to be having. But when you have so many different priorities, how do we also infuse that into our day-to-day -day work? Um, and you know, nonprofits are, I, I think a lot of grant writers know this, uh, a lot of nonprofits are always pressured to do more or to innovate, to scale, to, um, have a new idea, and we certainly have those, but if we don't have the base capacity, if we don't have the foundation to be able to do that work, it makes it a really big challenge. So we're trying to shift that conversation away from constantly growing, constantly innovating to let's think about the core capacity that we actually really need to do the work, and then we can talk about innovation and growth. Uh, we are trying to, though, of course, like asking nonprofits to join our conversations around philanthropy reform and access to funding. It is really challenging when there are so many barriers to be able to obtain funds to be able to meet all those needs that I just talked about. And so we want to continue to um, push on those changes that we know that we can see um, so that nonprofits can actually do the work that they are um, they're, they, they're there to exist for. 
And lastly, um, a lot of direct service organizations really feel that if their work is really a Band-Aid. If you are trying to meet the needs of housing or address food and how, um, food insecurities, um, these are just uh, issues that needed to be addressed at the fundamental level. Why do, why do these disparities exist? Why are there homeless people? But right now we just need to make sure that these folks have a safe place to be, that families are being fed. And so I think that there is also a desire from the nonprofit sector to really un address the underlying historical root causes uh, that we're all trying to address. Almost done, Rick, sorry about that. Um, no. So just to wrap us up, uh, these are sort of our priorities for 2022. There is a lot to address and we're trying to hone in on things that we think that we can help really um, make a difference in terms of the nonprofit sector. So our big one is, as I mentioned, the nonprofit relief fund. We, the governor has proposed a $50 million fund in his proposal. We are really pushing for a $200 million nonprofit relief fund, especially knowing the, um, the surplus that the state has uh, projected, as well as this one-time funding that is coming in through the American Rescue Plan Act. And we really need your support in calling your legislators right now, both the House and the Senate bills have not included the nonprofit relief fund, despite the fact that we are so critical to the recovery of the Minnesota economy. Um, so we are also trying to make sure that not all nonprofits, because the fact that we need the relief funds were not accessible to many nonprofits, that how do we make sure that if there are funds available to nonprofits that we can access them? And so we're, uh, we're working with uh, Grants Administration Office. We are trying to set up our own uh, website around all the different one-time dollars that are coming into the state so that it makes it accessible to nonprofits. Uh, and we're continuing to work on that as well. We are always constantly trying to strengthen incentives for charitable giving and volunteerism. Um, at the federal level, for example, we are um, trying to raise the um, the amount of volunteer mileage reimbursement that volunteers receive. I've heard from a couple of people that, you know, volunteerism, it's great and it's really expensive, especially in rural communities. If you have to drive many, many miles to go and help support your communities and the gas prices are the way that it is, if you're only being reimbursed for 14, per, 14 cents per, per mile versus 58 cents per mile that the corporations receive, um, that, is, that is going to be a really huge burden on the on the individuals who really want to contribute their time and talent into the nonprofit sector. Um, in addition to that, in terms of being a robust and supportive workforce, we believe in affordable health care and child care and paying medical family leave, so we continue to advocate for that. We believe in the importance in civic and participation in democracy and the roles that nonprofits can play in encouraging their communities to participate in having their voice be heard. Uh, we are trying to you know, support um, traditionally marginalized communities, communities of color, rural communities, small communities, um, and, and, and trying to help direct those funding to those um, communities. Um, we do also support the Federal ACE Act uh, that is um, just seeking reasonable transparency and reform for donor advice funds, as well as, um, lastly, uh, responsive research and resource on the impact of COVID-19. So uh, we're looking at uh, either, you know, continue to do these COVID-19 impact reports or using our surveys and our platform to hear back from communities, sorry, from our organizations and our members so that elected officials and decision makers can really hear directly from us. And I can't leave you without plugging our amazing workshops that are coming up. So I encourage you to go to minnesotanonprofits.org events and look at all the amazing um, uh, workshops that are coming up in the next two months. With that, I will stop and <laughs> Rick, over to you. Well, thanks, uh, Minoko. That uh, really illustrates the wide range of services that the council provides and the issues that the sector is uh, is dealing with. Uh, we're starting to get some questions here and I'll, uh, I'll be uh, forwarding those. Uh, uh, so um, one, one of the, um, I'll, I'll start out with uh, one, um, and I, I know you were appointed by Governor Wells to the Council of Economic Expansion to um, uh, this last fall to develop recommendations and the the bills you talked about and the priorities I assume are sort of sh show are reflective of of what uh, the council uh, did. But 
what 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 were the takeaways from that um, that work? I, I'm glad that you were appointed. It would astound people on the street to know that nonprofits are 14 percent of the employment uh, population in the state of Minnesota. I really think that's a, that's a big takeaway. But if you talk a little bit about that that responsibility, and then uh, we'll drill in a little deeper into the legislative activity. Sure. Um... Yeah, and I, 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 you know what? I just want to um, commend Minnesota because yes, Minnesota nonprofits are fourteen percent of the economy nationwide. Nonprofits represent ten percent of the economy, so we are really killing it in terms of our participation in terms of civics. As, you know, like our voting right, voting um, habits are really good as well. So we are um, we are strong and um, so grateful for so many different nonprofits that are doing incredible and um, impactful work in our state. So yeah, so I've been appointed, um, I believe there are 15 of us on the governor's council. Um, I represent obviously the nonprofit sector, but we also have folks in the corporate sector, in uh, uh, labor uh, organizers, um, different direct service providers. So many of us represent um, um, a wide range of sectors. So I am one voice um, and our task, there are two tasks. So prior to 20, in 2021, our phase one work was to recommend to the governor uh, how to best use the one-time funding that's coming in towards an equitable um, Minnesota. And so not surprising, I hope to many of you, but we have identified, of course, the need for childcare and healthcare as a way to bring people back into the workforce. If you don't have stable housing, if you don't have a place to have your children safe during the time that you are working, it is really, really difficult, of course, to come back to the workforce. Um, we also looked at, you know, how do we encourage more workers to come, not even just come back, but also come into our state and support the, you know, the current workers who are currently living in Minnesota. So we talked about um, how do we uh, think about youth and youth development and, you know, creating a pathway towards careers and introducing them to different types of careers. We also talked about the importance of health care, of course, infrastructure in Minnesota, um, so yeah, so those are just like the big general recommendations that we made to the governor in phase one. And now in 2022 through June, we are in phase two, which is to really think about the long-term economic recovery or prosperity for Minnesota. So right now we are in um, subcommittees kind of trying to dig a little bit deeper into um, issues that we think would really um, help to bolster the Minnesota economy. Um, so things around, um, you know, highlighting Minnesota's strength around uh, our culture and outdoor education, our civic engagement, and how do we continue to ensure that people have voices um, around our caring, caregiving um, communities. Um, these are folks who are really struggling uh, to help support uh, these mental health professionals and social workers and caregivers, like folks who work in um, preschools all the way to uh, um, nursing homes. They were burnt out and exhausted and underpaid. Um, and so what are some ways that we can encourage not just uh, people who want to go into those fields so that we can continue to make sure that the support is there, but to help support the workers who are currently um, doing their best in this in this environment and supporting the needs of our communities. Um, so those are those are recommendations that we would be making to the governor, um, and a lot uh, many of the commissioners are also uh, working in partnership with us. We're bringing in a lot of different speakers. We think it's really important for us to hear directly from the community. So we're utilizing our networks that, that exist to try to bring in speakers so we can learn more. Um, and the phase two recommendations we're hoping will come out in June. So if you'd like to learn more, um, I think the easiest way is to Google uh, the governor, the Minnesota governors. Um, Council on Economic Expansion. And if you research phase one, there there's a big report uh, that was released at the end of last year that you can read a little bit more about in terms of the details that I just talked about. Thanks, Anoko. And before we went on the air, we, uh, Anoko and I had a chance to talk about the legislature. Uh, the, there, the, we're down to about five weeks of uh, session left. And uh, I was able to join the Minnesota Chamber yesterday and listen and talk to legislators on both sides of the aisle. There seemed to be a common thread about 
getting the bonding bill passed. I know a lot of the non-for-profits have got specific bills uh, for their facilities or other projects. And a good takeaway was that that appears that uh, that will be done. A little less optimistic on uh, other issues related to reconstruction of the urban areas and, and, and such, but we always stand, uh, and I'm personally willing to help on anybody's uh, bonding bill or legislative ask. I've got relationships on both sides of the aisle uh, and we're down to about five weeks, so probably will not be a special session because they're all running for re-election, both House and Senate, and uh, so we're really coming down to uh, brass tacks. Any other final legislative thoughts? Nanoko, I know you're up on the Hill probably frequently carrying the message and the uh, Actually, I have the a really interesting uh, team um, of policy folks working for me. Um, so we have two arms. I don't know if you knew, the, knew that, but we also, of course, have the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits policy team um, who are really focused right now on the Nonprofit Relief Fund. And also um, this bill that is gaining a little bit of traction, especially in the Senate, around uh, putting in regulations for organizations, nonprofit organizations that receive government funds. Um, so they're really focused their attention on that. And with COVID as well, even though we are Minnesota focused, we had to like do a little bit of work at the federal level as well. Um, and then it, and then our other arm is called the Minnesota Budget Project. And they are, uh, they are a team of really incredibly smart uh, folks who analyze tax policies to help support uh, low income um, and families and Minnesotans. Essentially, the communities and nonprofits tend to serve and making sure that the tax policies really do center the needs of the lowest income Minnesotans because their prosperity, of course, uh, impacts all of us as well. So, um, yeah, so I, yeah, I hope that answered your question a little bit. Yeah, great, great, thank you. We're getting some questions from founders of nonprofit organizations and as bankers, I always look at uh, founding executive directors as really entrepreneurs in a way. And uh, I was impressed when I was on the Bigelow Foundation, how many emerging not-for-profits there are, really local, really um, specific focused not-for-profits. So can the, is the council able to help those startups in the same way that it does and can with other more mature and established organizations? Yes, of course. Um, so we, you know, uh, I mean, our resources, our trainings um, uh, include things around how to start a nonprofit, uh, which, you know, like just kind of walks you through step by step in terms of how to um, go through all the different filings and uh, articles of incorporation and how many um, you know, board members do you have to have? Like these are education that we think is really important for nonprofit, for folks who are trying to start a nonprofit. Um, of course, there are fiscal agencies. We do not fiscally uh, sponsor any organizations, but our um, friends at Propel, for example, they support many small um, BIPOC-led nonprofit organizations that just needed to start with the idea that, you know, with enough support that they can go and fly on their own and become their own separate entity. So there are, of course, avenues to become a fiscally sponsored organization. I think what's also interesting is the rise in more of a mutual aid program. So they're not officially nonprofits uh, in terms of their tax codes. It's really around neighbors helping neighbors. Um, and communities seeing the community need and giving money directly to those communities. And so, um, you know, because of the fact that they're not quite entities <laughs> necessarily, we're trying to figure out the ways, best ways to support them, but they are meeting community needs. And this is, this is an approach that many communities have felt that this, that is going to work best for them rather than donating directly to a nonprofit that in the nonprofit help support the community. How do we ensure that, you know, I see a need right now and this is the way that we're able to help support them. So um, those kind of programs are certainly um, popping up. And so there are different ways of us, I suppose, like a startup, this, this entrepreneurial spirit is seen in many different ways in our sector. Great. Here's a question from one of our small business owners, and uh, I, um, it's about how what they can do to help uh, nonprofits. And I know speaking for the bank, in the areas of financial education and financial inclusion, we rely so much on the not-for-profit sector. They've done so much work, and we're able to work um, with uh, with our customers 
families and individuals and businesses to work uh, to work uh, with those needs that wouldn't otherwise be provided and the bank doesn't have the expertise. So it's not just government that's sort of relying on this sector, but it also is the private sector. But in general, what, what should small businesses, what can they do? Uh, and if you uh, could address that, Ninoko. No, I think the, of course, like different people have different opinions about this. So I encourage you to talk to the leaders of nonprofits that um, that you care about, because you, I think, you know, within your own small business community or your neighborhoods, or even you as an individual, may have a cause that you really deeply care about, and they're all needing your help. And so, talking directly to them and asking about what they need, I think, is a really good first step. Um, rather than relying on a big, um, you know, like so we, we, we oversee so many different nonprofits, so I can't tell you like this particular nonprofit needs this particular thing. Um, as small businesses, though, I think as you are um, hearing about one-time relief funds that help support small businesses, which we, I think, really care about as well. We want to see that um, small businesses thrive in our communities. I, I would really, I would really like to see folks remind themselves that nonprofits, small nonprofits are also small businesses as well. And so what we have seen is when there are um, relief funds that's available for businesses or for small businesses, a lot of times nonprofits are left behind in that. Um, and so as much as you can help advocate for the nonprofits and say like, hey, that's great that we're receiving, we have this opportunity to receive this fund to help us, our nonprofits included. Those are kind of the conversations and continuous questions that we continue, we, we ask all the time and more people asking that question, I think will be really helpful for us as well. Great. There's a theme from a couple of questions to Noko about sort of the fear of, um, of uh, moving past uh, the murder of George Floyd and moving past the focus on BIPOC business, sort of the sort of human nature to deal with the crisis that's in front of us and, you know, maybe a more, uh, maybe broad economic uh, recession or a war or any of that. But how do we, how do, uh, th that incident and, and was so recent, but there's a concern about forgetting about it quickly. And you addressed a little bit of that in your priorities. Sure. Um... I mean, the sheer fact that you, whoever are asking these questions are asking them is a good thing. And I think we always continuously need to be asking it. The work around, especially work around racial equity is not new. <laughs> it's been going on for centuries. And so communities of color in particular have been fighting for their civil rights and for their ability to, for their voices to be heard for their needs to be recognized, to have a seat at the table. I think those are things that has always existed. It just became more um, aware to the dominant culture, perhaps after um, George Foley was murdered in 2020. I also think that uh, the work around diversity or equity or inclusion or whatever that term is, I mean, the thing is like the, the words keep on changing all the time. But fundamentally, I think we all want the same thing. We want to see communities thrive. And um, and I believe, like, you know, if we are able to apply the philosophy of universal design. So that is a, that is a philosophy around the fact that if you support those uh, who are in need the most, everybody else benefits. So the biggest example is, uh, one of the examples is, let's say, those um, ADA-compliant uh, door um, buttons that you push so that wheelchair folks can uh, go into the door. You know, like, so those were created, of course, with folks who have mobility issues in mind, but I use them when I'm pushing my stroller or have groceries in my hands and I just need to use them. Like, yes, it was designed for one type of, like, or one particular type of folks, but then other people benefit from that as well. And I think it just, like, I think it's really overwhelming to have to think about, like, how do we build a culture or how do we help support communities that are in need? And, you know, how do we diversify my staff when all I just need is just people to come and work for us? Like, I just don't even have time 
important to um, you know bring in a diverse uh, perspective into our organization. I mean, I could put in an argument there to say that actually organizations really benefit from diverse perspectives. But I also encourage folks to think about the fact that diversity is not just about race and ethnicity. It can be, and I think it is important for us to center that. But it is also around, you know, if you work uh, for an organization that serves people with disabilities, are different types of disabilities represented in your organization? Um, it, you know, if you are working for um, a youth-based organization, are youth represented in the voices and the decision-making voices as part of your board or your advisory board? Um, if you, you know, our rural voice, if you're a statewide organization, our rural voices centered and, and recognized in, in your decision-making processes, those are all diversity work. And I think if you recognize those small changes that you are making, ultimately it is a journey not, it's not a checklist. Sometimes I know a lot of people want that checklist to be like, yep, we did this, 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 and now we're done with DEI work. It's never going to be the case. This is a, this is a marathon. Um, and that I think I, I'm grateful that people are still asking those questions. We don't want to forget. We want to make sure that we're continuing this path. And I think that there are many different ways to be able to um, apply that lens into all aspects of our work. From, from HR, of course, to how we view our policies, to how we talk to um, what kind of, you know, communities that we are trying to center and meet with. Um, and, and it's also a individual work as well. I think we all need to be doing our own individual work and understanding what is, you know, what is my place and what is my privilege that I have and how do I use that to help serve people and communities in need. Great. A couple of times, Nadelko, you mentioned rural and at least from my standpoint it's easy to be metro centric um this is the world in which we live every day but you do represent um greater minnesota and poverty and needs are i guess they're concentrated but they're also more dispersed and maybe more hidden can you talk about their particular needs and what are those challenges yeah um of course, I think, you know, it's always hard for, I think this is also tied to DEI. When you're so ingrained in like things that's happening around you all the time, it's really hard to think about people who are, people in communities are not necessarily part of your immediate network. And I'm also certainly guilty of that as well. And that's part of the reason why it's really important for me to remind myself that we are statewide organizations and the need of rural communities are vastly different, but also somewhat the same as metro area. And so what I'm hearing from uh, from organizations and rural communities is just like, we need more affordable housing. We know, you know what, we just need housing. We need housing so we can bring people here so that they have a place to live so that we can attract more workers in our, in our area. Um, but their, 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 um, their need is unique because of the fact, and, and I, I also think it's really important for us to distinguish the difference between greater Minnesota and rural Minnesota. So this isn't necessarily a divide between Metro or the Twin Cities versus everyone else. It is also a question just around how rural, small, small, tiny communities are being supported um, and, and heard. And that is, that, that is, I think, one of the most frustrating things for many um, communities that I'm hearing from is the fact that they're just not heard. They're being ignored. Um, elected officials are, you know, constantly like hearing the loudest voices, which tends to be the, of course, the, you know, well-populated areas, whether that's the Twin Cities, of course, but you know, Rochester, uh, Duluth, those are big communities. So they are in greater Minnesota, but they're not quite rural. When one mental health organization closes in a rural community, there are no other rural, there are no other mental health organizations within 30, 50 miles that communities can access. That is not quite the case in the metro area. And so, yes, it is devastating for communities when an organization has been instrumental, closes down because of funding or because of so many different factors. But the impact, as I think, is more exponential in, in rural areas. Volunteerism is also an issue. Like we in the metro, we're lucky that we have certain infrastructure in place for public transportation. In some rural areas, the buses run twice a month. And so how, as a volunteer, are you supposed to go if you don't have a car? I think in terms of civic engagement as well, I just heard that, you know, um, voting places can be, you know, 10 miles apart. Like how, 
if you don't have a car, if you don't have a reliable form of transportation, how are you supposed to have your voice heard and to be able to go and take the, what, a good chunk of your work day to go and, and uh, vote for the values that you believe in when everything is so farther apart. And so I think, yeah, and I, and I think, you know, there are not enough funding sources as well. Like, I mean, yes, like there's more concentrated nonprofits. Uh, there's more, you know, people and communities in, in cities, and yet there is still a need in rural communities. And I really feel strongly that they cannot be forgotten and that funders need to remember that they are still there and doing critical work. And as much as they can, they need to also be thinking about how they can best support rural communities. Great. One of the comments I heard from a legislator in greater Minnesota was, you know, the redistricting resulted in fewer elected officials from those areas. So their voices are even less than they were before the, uh, the census tract. Sure. A, yeah. You mentioned a couple of times we have a question about mental health and um, this is the con this is maybe top three sort of common themes that we're hearing uh, for employers, uh, for families. Um, is this going to show up? And I know you work close to the Council of Foundations. Is this a theme for sort of grant writing as it go forward? And uh, would you encourage folks to be a workshop on that going forward at all in terms of how grants should be written and what focus areas they should be? Sorry, this is like in particular around mental, like to help support mental health? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um. So I, okay, yes, funding is needed, <laughs> period. I think um, funders who do not fund personnel cost, I think should be reevaluating their grant strategies. Um, people are the core assets of any nonprofit organization that at least employs one staff member. Um, and if that person or people are not able to do their work effectively if they cannot take care of themselves how do they i mean this is the this is the airplane rule right like you hear this all the time every time we sit in the airplane you have to take care of you put the mask on first before you help your dependent and this is the same thing if you can't help yourself how are you expected to help others um and so yes for nonprofit organizations to be able to provide adequate mental health support perhaps in a form of a professional they need money to be able to do that. They need money to be able to pay for the benefits, to be able to offer their staff health benefits. Um, those are, I, I, I mean, personally, this is a personal view, but I just feel like this is this is a this is a fundamental human right to access adequate, not even adequate, strong and affordable healthcare. Um, and in addition to that, I think leaders can also be thinking about how they can be supporting their staff and their organizations in terms of um, paid time off being more, um, you know, doing doing more of a check-in. I know leaders are also struggling as well. This isn't necessarily to say like leaders should add more to their plate, but their, their job is to help make sure that their organization is thriving. And that's also staff management and support. Um, and, you know, encouraging, leading by example when you are tired and exhausted you take that mental health day and you take that sick day and make it make it okay for other staff members to do the same um i think that's like you know that's also tied to sort of the workforce or the changing um culture within organizations as well as we're thinking about flexible hours and more time off and you know maybe a, a significant break during the summer or something along those lines i mean there are different organizations thinking about ways that they can help support their team. I think the biggest thing for me is that organization leaders in the organization should be really listening to their staff because they're the ones who are actually doing the work. They're the ones on the ground. And if they tell you like, this is what we need, then you can work in partnership with them to build a organizational culture that is going to help support them because, and recognize the fact that they're having, you know, they're, they're doing extremely difficult work. Um, and keep in mind, like these are, you know, these nonprofit organizations, especially those who are in direct service, <laughs> they are also supporting the mental health needs of their community as well. And so 
it's it's like it's it's just like um it's a challenge, of course, like when you're trying to help support, you know, when you, when you as an individual, was as a professional, as a trained professional in mental health, trying to help support community members in terms of their mental health, and you know you're not getting it yourself, it just becomes really demoralizing and really, really difficult. And then compounded with that, most likely they're underpaid because federal uh, reimbursement um, has not met up with inflation. And so mental health professionals or, or organizations are not being reimbursed at a rate that they could be paying their staff. Uh, so there's a lot of different challenges there. And I think there's one like advocacy, there's also a um, role of philanthropy, there's roles of leaders, and there's also role of workers as well to make sure that um, mental health you know, needs are being met across the organizations as well as in our community. You know, there's so many takeaways, Nanoko, from what you just said about mental health. One of them that I'll key on is um, donors and foundations don't want to pay for personnel costs. And I know as a region of the university, our very generous donors you know, they, they steered toward buildings and facilities or maybe for scholarships for students, but no one, you know, it isn't exciting to sort of pay to add on for personnel costs, but that's really what's needed. We talk about mental health. We need, we need you know, direct services to, to folks. Okay, well, we are, um, we are quickly running out of time here. And uh, so I think we'll wrap up. Um, this has been really a terrific presentation. You've given us so much uh, to think about, and uh, we we um, it's 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 impressive everything that you're doing personally, uh, leading the organization and and as well as the organization. And uh, we stand by to help uh, the council in any way can uh, we can, and as well as um, those organizations who are are with the bank. I want to remind the nonprofits on the line we we have a big platform we'd love to carry your story uh, uh on our platform so feel free to reach out with uh, to carry or myself or your banker if you want to have your story told because your story is unique it's important and it's powerful so um we'll do that any final comments Nanoka, before we move along no, um, I just, yeah, thank you, Rick, for inviting me here. I, I noticed somebody talked about women and girls, but I just I just wanted to note the fact that the nonprofit sector in Minnesota, 75% of workers are women, identify as women. Um, and that does add to the challenges of workforce because um, sectors that are represented by women are rebounding at a, low, a, a slower rate than uh, sectors that are predominantly men. Or um, And... And because, of, I mean, particularly because of the disproportionate impact that many women carry around childcare and caregiving responsibilities. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's all like intersectional and tied together. And I just wanted to note that because I think it's really important for us to recognize that women play a very important role in our, in our economy and we need to be supported. Um, so whoever asked that question, thank you. And thank you for supporting women and girls. Well, that's great. Thanks uh, very much, Noko. Someone did ask. Uh, we will uh, share the slides. We'll talk uh, about how to get uh, that done. And Noko, we weren't able to ask all the questions, so she'll be able to address some of these individually. I know there are some reaching out to try to get her to be a speaker or, or come out and visit the organizations. Okay, well, on behalf of Sunrise Banks, Terry, thank you, and our staff that helped arrange this session uh, this morning. Have a great uh, spring day and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks everyone.